delighted to be here today. Um, I wanted to tell you about both the work we've been doing to support um, breakthrough technologies in fuel cells, um, and also some analysis that we've launched today um, uh, as to what these breakthrough technologies could do in terms of market penetration and unlocking value for fuel cells, particularly for the auto market. Before I get on to that, I wanted to say a little bit about the Carbon Trust. Um, we've got a 10-year history. Um, our mission is to accelerate the move to a low-carbon economy, and we're an independent organisation, um, increasingly working internationally. Historically, we've worked pretty much in the UK, but over the last couple of years, we've been uh, broadening our, our horizons. We do three principal things. We advise businesses, governments, and the public sector on opportunities in a sustainable, low-carbon world. We've worked with 75% of the FTSE 100, for example, in carbon management. We've worked with tens of thousands of SMEs on energy efficiency advice. Um, we've worked with a lot of governments on different aspects of policy. I've done a lot of work over the years with the UK government. Increasingly, we're working with other governments. So at the moment, we're doing studies in Mexico, South Africa, Brazil. Increasingly, as well, helping them design energy efficiency and innovation programs and policies. Um, the second big aspect of what we do at the Carbon <coughs> Trust is measure and certify um, environmental performance, both at organization level for companies, but then also for products and services. Um, we've got something called the Carbon Trust Standard uh, for organizations. We've got over 600 companies that have got that seal of approval, that a company's measured its emissions, it's got a carbon management strategy, and it's reducing its emissions. Again, increasing that's in international. Korea came up a lot this morning. Um, we have a partner in Korea that's rolling that, that standard out. We've been piloting and trialing it as well in China. We find a lot of countries in Southeast Asia want to get a stamp of approval so they can export to the West. Um, likewise, we've been measuring carbon footprints of products. We've measured over 6,000 products. Um, earlier, it was mentioned that cars might go the way of embedded carbon content, the full life cycle carbon footprint of a car. Um, We've been doing that for a number of years and actually created the world's first standard for how you measure a carbon footprint of a product. And we have a label as well. It's bigger than fair trade. Over 3.6 billion pounds worth of products have that Carbon Trust label on. Um, and 70% of kitchens will have a Carbon Trust labeled product on, within that kitchen in the UK. The third area, which I'm really talking about today, is how we help develop and support um, low carbon technologies. Um, we have an integrated offer across the innovation chain everything from applied research um, through to large-scale demonstration programs and cost reduction programs which are working collaboratively with industries. For example, in offshore wind, we're aiming to reduce the cost of the offshore wind by 10% by working with eight of the world's leading developers in a £45 million pound program. Um, we're also Europe's largest clean tech VC investor. Um, we've invested over £50 million pounds in early-stage companies. Um, and the Polymer Fuel Cells Challenge, which I'll talk about today, is one of our programs that we've been running um, to help drive forward new technologies and commercialize them. And a real focus at the Carbon Trust is that commercialization. We measure ourselves by how much um, investment we catalyze. So we've invested, we've catalyzed over 300 million pounds worth of investment in clean technologies to date. So what is the polymer fuel cells challenge? We abbreviate it to PFCC, so sorry, you'll see that all the way through this presentation. Um, we set it up in 2009. It's a, seven year, a five year, seven million pound program. Uh, we looked at the fuel cells market and realized that there was some real capabilities in the UK to create a breakthrough in polymer fuel cell costs to make it viable to enter the auto market. Um, so we set ourselves the aim of trying to reduce the cost of offshore wind by a third at high volumes. Um, so the detailed objectives of the scheme, we did some analysis right at the beginning of the scheme to work out, well, what, what cost point would a fuel cell system need to get to to compete with an internal combustion engine on a total cost of ownership basis? Um, we worked out that you'd need to get to a cost point of $36 per kilowatt at a volume of 50,000 units, sorry, 500,000 units per annum. So that's the kind of cost point that we've set ourselves the target to get to. Um, we also, as part of this program, this five-year program, want to demonstrate the system at a scale that's going to be attractive for auto OEMs. So they can see that and say, yes, I believe this is a viable solution. As, as a consequence, we want to get to a point where the companies and the technologies we're supporting have actual development agreements with auto OEMs, um, and they've got their ideas protected with patents. Um, in order to do that, our approach has been to really understand the innovation landscape in, in polymer fuel cells, work out where the opportunities lie, 
and then run a major competition to select the best technologies, a nationwide competition. And we had 15 companies shortlisted in that competition, and three got through to the first phase, and a fourth has actually made it into the second phase, which I'll talk about in a moment. So they've gone through a lot of technical due diligence to get onto this program. We also, it's interesting you teed it up as uh, getting value for money, this isn't a grant program. We're making commercial investments in the second phase of this program into the companies, because we believe they will make commercial returns, so we're investing commercially <coughs> in the companies. Um, and we're also looking as the Carbon Trust to help them engage with the auto industry uh, to, to unlock this opportunity. Um, and I must mention as well our technical experts that are supporting this program. Without it, um, it would be much weaker. We really do have world experts that are helping support the selection of companies, but also the development of these companies. Um, uh, David Hart is here today um, uh, with 25 years' experience, as you mentioned earlier. We've also got Douglas Wheeler with over 40 years of experience in the US, and we've also got Charles Stone, a former VP um, at Ballard Power Systems from Canada. Um, so the journey we've been on, for the last two years, we've been proving the feasibility of these technologies, and now we're just in our second phase starting our second phase where we're making larger investments in the companies so they can demonstrate their technologies at the next level of scale and get those agreements with the auto OEMs. Um, so to talk a little bit about the technologies and the areas we're focusing on. I said earlier we worked out which areas needed to have real focus if we're going to get this technology cost breakthrough um, to be competitive with internal combustion engines. Um, the four areas we focused on were increasing power density, reducing platinum use, uh, reducing the fuel cell system complexity and improving durability. And the four companies that have made it through this difficult competition to get to this second phase really do hit those four key drivers of cost. So, and two of them are going to present in this next session, ITM presented earlier on. So ACAL have a, uh, a new type of uh, uh, polymer fuel cell which uses a polymer cathode design to reduce platinum use by 75% and has the, the best performing results of a, of a low platinum fuel cell that, that's been tested to date. Um, ITM power, we, we heard from them earlier in the context of electrolysis, those membranes can also be used in a fuel cell um, and they have the highest power density um, measurements that have been recorded in the literature to date um, through the work that we've been doing with them to the, uh, in this first phase. Um, Imperial College and University um, yeah, Imperial College and UCL, um, we've been supporting. They're, they're earlier stage. They're still in the lab, but they've got a really novel design. They've, they've got a layered arrangement of la laminated printed circuit boards bonded on top of each other to create a much simpler, more fault-tolerant, fault low-cost fuel cell stack. And then finally, we've got Ilica, which is a material selection company, we're going to present in a moment, who have got a new alternative to platinum, uh, which will reduce the costs of the catalyst by 70%. So what we've been doing, and what I wanted to share with you today was the results of this new analysis that we've done to work out, well, what could the impact on the market be if we managed to bring these new uh, breakthrough technologies um, through, uh, is first of all looking at, from a bottom-up technical perspective, what could the cost advantage be over the best practice polymer fuel cells out there at the moment? So in the chart on the left-hand side, I show the, the fuel cell system cost of a baseline polymer fuel cell. Um, and it's around $49 per kilowatt when you're manufacturing at a scale of 500,000 units. That's way off that $36 per kilowatt target I mentioned earlier on. What we've done is for each of the, the three system level technologies we've been working with, so ITM, um, ACAL, and uh, Imperial College, UCL, um, we've broken down exactly what the cost advantage will be of these technologies when they get to scale. And you can see here for Imperial UCL, there's significant advantages in fuel management, water management, air management, and then also the final stack assembly, balance of stack, and the seal. Um, so they're actually getting way below that $36 per kilowatt target. Um, what we've then done is use this bottom-up cost analysis to work out what the impact on total cost of ownership of the car is, um, then look at other performance characteristics that people take into account when making purchasing decisions for a car, and then work out a purchasing probability so we can start to look at well, what, what might be the increase in penetration of fuel cell vehicles over time be, um, and 
what, therefore, might the market values be and the CO2 savings be over time? And I'll share these results with you. First of all, on the cost, each of the three system level um, uh, fuel cell um, projects that we've been working with are able to beat that $36 per kilowatt target to get cost competitive with inter internal combustion engine. Um, the solid bars here um, in the chart are what we get just from looking at the fuel cell component by component. The dotted line, which for a couple of the technologies is what gets them below that $36 per kilowatt target, takes into account that actually some of the functionality of the fuel cell um, is outside the limits of the, the way the model's done. So, for example, with the Imperial College, the, uh, the power controls are integrated within the fuel cell, so you've got an additional benefit. The other aspect is that these have improved fault tolerance and durability, which impact the total cost of ownership. So there is a real cost advantage, and they beat that $36 per kilowatt automotive target. Um, what does that do to market share? Uh, we've modelled it out from today out to 2050, um, what the penetration of fuel cell vehicles could be. Um, so the chart here shows the cumulative deployment over time in million, million units um, globally. We've got uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, fuel cell electric vehicles, and internal combustion engine. Um, and what you see there is that there's a couple of dotted lines that shows you where the boundary between the, the plug-in hybrid and the internal combustion engine would be without these technology breakthroughs. So we would expect about 25% of the 2050 market uh, for vehicles in the CD medium-sized car market to be fuel cell electric vehicles. If we can get these technology breakthroughs so they get cost competitive sooner, we'd expect that market share to expand by a 9% or up to 34% on that uh, in, in total. And that means 200 million, 200 million extra fuel cell electric vehicles on the, on the road globally and 3.3 million extra vehicles in the UK um, and a 30 billion pound increase in market value in 2050 uh, and 400 million dollars in, in the UK. But that, that seems a long way off. <laughs> It's 2050 analysis. Um, what's really important is that these fuel cell systems should be available for that next generation of um, cars. We saw earlier the pictures of the first tranche of fuel cell vehicles that are coming through for 2015. We're hoping to see these in the under the bonnet by 2020. And interestingly, by 2030, our analysis shows that they could double the penetration of fuel cell electric vehicles in the UK. So we, we, the analysis shows that they could go up from 1 million uh, to 2 million fuel cell electric vehicles in the UK by 2020, uh, by 2030, sorry. So there's real short-term deployment that we'll see and massive increase in value of the market out when one looks looks over that very long period. Um, the other aspect that's important is CO2 savings. There's been a lot of conversation over the course of the day of how um, the speed with which hydrogen will be decarbonized and therefore the net CO2 savings. We, we've taken as an input the both uh, for the the cost of the fuel and the decarbonisation scenario, the McKinsey Powertrains for Europe analysis, which shows a gradual decarbonisation as one moves to um, electrolysis through renewables, but also through CCS um, and other low carbon sources of electricity. And you see here, these charts show, well, what would be the additional carbon savings as a result of the pure, this breakthrough in technology? So moving from 25% you know, of the market to 34%. And we're seeing in 2050 globally, that would be 260 million tonnes of CO2. And that's the emissions of a reasonable sized country, something like Netherlands or Taiwan. So this is real. This is a very significant carbon saving we're talking about. There's also impacts on other markets. So we've analysed what the impact would, would be in terms of increased penetration for other applications for fuel cells. Um, you can see here, when you look at market share, cumulative deployment and annual market value out in 2050, the values, you know, the, the economic value is all in the car, well, is dominated by the car application. But these other applications are material in their own right, but also importantly, they're transition markets. So they're ones that might be earlier ones for the fuel cells to penetrate into and reduce the cost through economies of scale and learning, as has been discussed today. So we're starting phase two. We're making significant investments in these firms. In ITM, we've just invested 1.1 million to both help them demonstrate their technology at the next level up and engage with auto uh, partners. In ACAL Energy, we've just invested 850,000, again, to demonstrate this, the technology at the next level up, um, demonstrate their ability to handle coal start requirements, and again, engage with the auto to get those kind of agreements. Imperial College and UCL, um, 
we're looking to demonstrate a one kilo one, st one stack. And as I said, they're at an earlier stage. So the next um, exercise with them is actually getting them set up as a company. So that's what we're going to help them do, hopefully, get themselves set up as a company so that we can invest in that organization. And then Ilica, who we're about to present as well, um, it's all about sending that material that they're producing to uh, cars, companies for pre-commercial testing um, and actually get a partner to really scale up the manufacture of this new material. Um, hopefully I've whetted your appetite for the presentations to come. That was my aim. But I think the conclusions from our analysis say that this is, these technology breakthroughs really will have an impact and are something to watch out for. Thank you.